Okay. Yes, so um, it is said that for us to understand a subject or well, we have to study it at least seven times <laughs> before we actually have a good handle on it. And uh, that is the case with me regarding this topic. Every time I present it, I, I come to understand it a little more. And I hope that for those of you who have been have heard the presentation of the frontal lobe, that will be the same case. That today you will come to understand a little more, that the spirit will speak to you from a different angle, and that this will be beneficial for your spiritual life. And for those of you who have never heard it, um, I think it will be quite interesting. And we'll try to make it as useful and practical as possible. Now, this slide is not in this presentation, I borrowed it from a different one, but it's, it's, it's a slide that shows Revelation 22 4. Uh, if you brought your Bible, if you have a device with a Bible in it, I invite you to look it up. Revelation 22 4. And it says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads speaking about the redeemed, being in front of the Lamb, and we will be in His presence. And the, the Bible says that those who will be in the presence of the Lamb, when we finally stand before Him in the heavenly courts, that they will have the name of the Lamb written on their foreheads. Now, of course, this is uh, symbolic language. It means not that they will have writing on their foreheads, but rather, as we know in the Bible, the word name means character, that those who stand before the Lamb will have the character of Jesus. And uh, how do we, how, how does God impress his character upon our minds and transform us. What part of our body does he use to do that? And that's what we're going to talk about. So here's the clicker. And let's see if, should I, where should I just point to that? Uh, yeah. well, let's see. Right there. Oh, there it is. Okay, so. To give you some facts about the human brain, there are many that we could share, but I picked out some of the salient ones. The brain is by far the most complicated structure ever investigated by science. It has about one billion nerve cells, and along those nerve cells, we have some cells called supporting cells, or glia, and there are more than 100 million glia cells. So all in all, the brain has probably, you know, 200 billion or more cells. Thousands of different types of neurons. So brain cells are called neurons. And here is a picture of a neuron. You can think of a neuron as uh, a, like a little flower <laughs> that has uh, you know, different leaves or uh, what you see here, you, you can liken it to something that's familiar to you. And the, the round part in the middle there, as you see, it's called the body of the neuron. And the little branches coming from the body, close to the body there, the short ones, uh, they're actually called branches, dendrites, um, or branches. And those are used uh, to communicate with other neurons, and those pick up information from the neurons around it. But there is this long one, like a tail, and that's called the axon, and that's the one the neuron uses to communicate to other neurons, so it sends messages to other neurons, whereas the short ones pick up messages from other neurons. And the next slide here shows that when a neuron communicates with another neuron, it, the point of contact is called a synapse. And a closer look at the synapse, 
will show that the way neurons communicate is by substances, by chemicals. It's a chemical message. And the different substances will communicate different messages. And remember this because as we uh, continue to present this weekend, you'll hear the names of these substances and how important they are for brain health. And to give you an example of one of the many types of neurons that there are in the brain, let's talk about a cell called Purkinje cell. The Purkinje cell um, is a very important cell, very um, it, it well connected, so to speak. As you can see, it has many, many dendrites or branches to, to speak to other neurons, to communicate. Uh, regular neurons make about a thousand connections with other neurons. The Purkinje cells can make up to 200,000 connections. There are an estimated 100 trillion synapses in the brain, but it is conjectured that there could be even 10 times more. So the brain is an amazing organ. It is where everything generates, who we are generates. So the brain, inside the brain, there's a section that we know as, as the mind, right? So the brain is the organ itself, but what it generates, we call what? The mind, right? That's, that's who we are, our personality, our character. Now, not much was known about what part of the brain contained the mind. Until something happened to this gentleman, by the name of Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage, uh, the story tells us, was a man who lived in Vermont. And he was a railroad foreman. Phineas Gage was known to be a faithful husband and father, well liked by fellow workers, religious man, with regular church attendance. But then something happened on September 13th, 1848. What happened to Phineas? Well, in Vermont, the process of laying down tracks goes like this. When they try to open up a hole in a mountain or move a mountain, they drill a long hole in the rock. They fill it partially with explosive powder, cover the powder with sand, consolidate the charge, use a tamping bar to pound it down, and then they light the fuse and it explodes and they open the way. Well, Phineas was doing this. Lo and behold, there was an accident. The tamping bar went from below, piercing where you see there, and coming out on the other side, on top of the brain. And as you can see from the picture, there was a part of the brain that was pierced and destroyed. So you would think he didn't make it, but miraculously he did. He lived. And you can see the um, skull there, and that's the actual skull of Phineas Gage. It currently sits at a museum in Harvard, uh, the University of Harvard. And why did he end up in Harvard? Let's find out. So Phineas Gage, as I said, survived. But the interesting thing about Phineas is that from being a known as a very congenial person, he had a change in personality. He actually became hard to get along with. From being known as a faithful husband, he became unfaithful. From going to church, he stopped going to church. From not using vulgarity in his language, he became vulgar. He became immoral. And then he picked up some bad habits, some drinking and so forth. There was a change in Phineas. And people marveled at this. The news reached the doctors at Harvard and they wanted to interview him. 
So Phidias became a subject of research. And as a result of the accident that he had and the change of personality he had, now we know that the frontal lobe, the part of the brain that Phidias had damaged, is the seat of morality, the seat of spirituality, and the seat of the will. Now these are, as you can see, three very important things in our lives. What is spirituality? It's our desire for the things of God. What is morality? It is our ability to know between, to discern between what? Right and wrong. And what is the will? The will is what? Our power of choice. And that's something that God has endowed us with. And all of these reside in this area of the brain called the frontal lobe. Can you see how important this area of the brain is? Think about the story of Phineas. He stopped going to church. He lost his desire for the things of God. He became unfaithful. He lost the ability to discern between what was right and wrong. He picked up bad habits. He started using vulgar language. And he became unrestrained. He picked up bad habits too, like drinking. Uh, so his power of choice was impaired. And the frontal lobe, uh, when, when the frontal lobe was damaged, that was a result. Let's look at the brain a little more to see how important this frontal lobe is. You see the brain there and the different lobes are colored. And you can see that the frontal lobe is the, lar the, the largest one. How large is the frontal lobe? Well, let's take a look and see how large it is and how important it is for us. For example, um, animals also have a brain and they also have frontal lobes. Cats, for example, their frontal lobe is 3% of their brain. And uh, think, of the, think about the personality of cats. Uh, I can give you one example that brings to life, how the frontal lobe, you know, plays out in the, in the cat. Does a cat feel any remorse for killing a mouse? No. Or for playing around with it? No. Do, do, are cats very friendly to many people, or are they usually not? They're pretty lone, and they don't really want to establish a personal relationship or a kind of, like, for example, dogs. Uh, they're different, right? Now, I'm not trying to uh, downplay the, 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 you know, how nice cats are. I know that many people like them, and that's totally fine. I'm just kind of illustrating personality and the relationship. You'll see how it makes sense a little down the presentation, uh, um, how the frontal lobe plays out in the personality of these animals. The dog has 7%. Monkeys have a little larger frontal lobe. But we have a much larger frontal lobe. It's a third of our brain is the frontal lobe. Now we have we have more. We have you you saw the picture. We have a, a lobe in the back called the occipital lobe. Then we have two upper lobes over here called parietal lobes. Then we have some lobes over here by the ears that are called temporal lobes. And so we have five other lobes besides the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is one third in total, and the, the other five are the two thirds. And so uh, there's a reason for this. And that's because the most important part in our brain is our mind, right? The frontal lobe, where the, where, where the spirituality, morality, and the will reside. And so what happens if there is damage to the frontal lobe? Impairment of moral principles. Social impairment, meaning loss of love for family. Also, lack of foresight. Abstract reasoning can be impaired. Mathematical understanding can be diminished. 
and loss of empathy and lack of restraint can also happen. And those, and those are only a few of the different problems that can occur as a result of having damaged the frontal lobe. Now you might wonder how can this happen? Well, we saw the example of Phineas. He pierced a metal bar through it. Uh, but there is also head, head injuries, right? Um, and for example, in some sports, they're so the head is used or there are violent um, injuries or blows to the head that can damage the frontal lobe. And there are also some diseases that will damage or will be characterized by damage of the frontal lobe. And so, are there any other causes? Yes, there are. And we'll explore them during this presentation. And we will see how you don't need to necessarily have an injury, a physical injury, to perhaps experience damage in the frontal lobe. Um, and so let's go on with continue with some of the features of having damage to the frontal lobe. Some studies have uh, looked at children with frontal lobe damage for whatever cause. And they have noticed that in children who have a um, frontal lobe that doesn't function 100%, there are temper outbursts when frustrated, verbally and physically assaultive, sexually promiscuous from early teens, non-sustained friendships, intermittent uh, use of alcohol and drugs, impulsive suicide attempts, uh, <clears throat> does not respond or do not respond to parental discipline, seek instant gratification, inadequate friendships, blaming others, irresponsibility, influenced by divine children, and even some divine sexual uh, behaviors like masturbation or bisexuality. Um, so frontal lobe damage in children can lead to poor choices earlier and later in life, and including um, choices that could lead to crime, it could lead to incarceration too. So, what else regarding the frontal lobe? Some diseases that we, common diseases of our day, are linked to frontal lobe damage. Uh, another, perhaps another descriptive word for damage would be uh, poor function or impairment or weakness. Uh, in other words, the function is decreased, decreased function of the frontal lobe. And that is perhaps more accurate, this, this phrase more accurately describes what I'm trying to, to explain, that the frontal lobe, when, it, when the function is decreased, it can result in impairment of all these areas that we have mentioned, but it can also result in some mental health problems, such as a mania, such as obsessive compulsive disorder, or other personality disorders too, such as disorders with appetite, increased appetite or abnormal uh, appetite, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, depression, bipolar disorder, and anxiety. So, it is clear that the frontal lobe is, is highly important, that we must take good care of it in order to have a healthy mind and decrease our risk of having all these problems associated with low function of the frontal lobe. Now this has been studied um, by doing something called PET scans. During a PET scan, somebody is injected with a substance that can color the area that is going to be studied. And uh, the brain uh, can show that. For example, in depressed individuals, uh, 
Uh, PET scans have been done before the beginning of treatment. And you can see on the picture on the left hand side that the brain of a depressed person shows very low activity in the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe being the upper part of the picture. But after treatment, you can see that the frontal lobe begins to function more. So there's more activity and that can be seen on PET scan. That is related to blood flow. So what's, what you're seeing there is the blood flow. So whenever the frontal lobe is weak or not functioning well, there is a decrease in blood flow there. But as the frontal lobe is being restored by different types of treatment, the blood flow increases to the frontal lobe. You might be wondering now, well, you mentioned that there might be other reasons for frontal lobe damage. I think I'd like to know what those are. So let's look at some of those that um, perhaps are not thought as being a problem regarding the frontal lobe. Legal drugs, such as alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine actually have a very big, big impact on the frontal lobe. Now, I imagine that I wouldn't have a hard time convincing, convincing most of you that alcohol is bad for the brain. But for the sake of thoroughness, um, I will tell you that alcohol basically blocks out the frontal lobe. Uh, alcohol is commonly used as something called a gateway drug because if someone goes to a party where drugs are being used, almost the first thing that will be served is alcohol. And after alcohol, people lose their ability to make right choices and they can use all kinds of other drugs. Now, alcohol also will uh, decrease the level of discernment in somebody regarding decisions and regarding words. So it makes someone less prudent. Do we have any biblical support for what I'm saying? Proverbs? Pardon? Uh huh. They have an abide Yes. The book of Proverbs clearly says that alcohol is a mocker. And clearly we have been worried about this and science has proved over and over that alcohol is a mocker and it is dangerous and damaging to our brains. Many, many uh, automobile accidents are linked to alcohol. How about nicotine? Nicotine found in cigarettes and cigars and um, the, uh, chew, the chewing form or chewable form of tobacco uh, is, a, is, a, is a drug that uh, gives a, a person a false sense of peace and comfort. Uh, it is temporary and when the effect is gone, it it calls for more of the drug and before the person know, knows they have become dependent on nicotine for their happiness. So it controls the life of a person as opposed to the person being in control of their own lives. And the same thing can be said about caffeine. Now let's talk a little more about caffeine as perhaps it's not suspected to be such a bad thing. But in reality, uh, God has been clear to us that he also would like us to avoid caffeine. And here's some of the reasons why. So caffeine um, causes a, an increase in a substance called adenosine. Now, adenosine is a substance that causes wakefulness. So caffeine will keep us Way, but also may interfere with our good quality sleep at night, which I'll give you a little bit of um, a 
preview, sleep is quite important to the health of the frontal lobe and, and our mental health. So if, some, if you're struggling already with having good quality sleep, you definitely want to avoid caffeine. It also causes a false surge of energy. It is a sense of energy that is being, it's abnormal because it's being created artificially and is depleting the brain from very important adenosine that is needed. And so when the effect is gone, a, a fatigue that is worse than the initial fatigue results. And so withdrawal calls for more caffeine. And so what happens is, again, the person becomes dependent on caffeine to be awake or to be productive. What studies have shown is that people uh, who perhaps drink caffeine, people who drink caffeine before a test, they will finish the test more quickly than those who don't, but they will make more mistakes. So you can see how caffeine impairs judgment. And they've done this on different types of tests, written tests and coordination tests too. I remember my dad, is, who is a retired pastor, he, for a time he was health and temperance director at his conference, this is down in Mexico. And he had uh, some slides from Loma Linda, Dr. Harding, and they were picture slides. We loved them, just we could watch them over and over and over. There was one about a about a spider. The spider was injected with caffeine. Uh, and they showed how the spider was able to, to, what's the verb that when they knit their web, is that the right ver verb? Weave. weave. When they weave their, their web, it, before caffeine it was perfect. You've seen, I mean, to me they're amazing. To see one of those and they finish it in one night, it, it's just amazing. Yeah. And, but they injected the spider with caffeine and the spider could not weave the web perfectly after that. So judgment is impaired, dexterity is impaired. And so those are some of the effects. But there is also, again, like we mentioned, there is the withdrawal that causes irritability. Let's take a look here causes irritability uh, and in order to have again a sense of calmness or um, euphoria or peace whatever then again the person needs to have uh, a drink but what else does caffeine cause well it increases uh, the risk of low birth weight uh, this is for pertinent to pregnant women or those who plan to be pregnant. It also elevates blood pressure and it causes uh, dangerous heart, heart arrhythmias. If any of you have atrial fibrillation, your cardiologist may have told you no more caffeine because it triggers atrial fibrillation, which is a dangerous arrhythmia because uncontrolled atrial fibrillation can lead to stroke. Uh, increases symptoms of PMS, premenstrual syndrome, so cramping and all that with, in, in women of reproductive age, and also can cause heartburn because it, that, that we have a valve between the esophagus and the stomach called the esophageal sphincter, the lower esophageal sphincter. It weakens that and it causes the acid, it makes it easier for the acid to flow upward, thereby causing heartburn. Those are some of the other effects. But here's an effect that you may not have suspected. <laughs> Studies have been done about people who drink caffeine at work, they've noticed they gossip more. That's <laughs> Now this is interesting because let's think about gossiping a little bit. Let's think about the Revelation 22.4 and what that verse says. And what God wants to do with us, His church. 
What commandment are we breaking when we gossip? The ninth commandment, someone said? Yes. What does the ninth commandment say? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Do we think much about gossiping when we gossip? Do we think that we're breaking God's law when we do it? Not really, right? But we are. And the reason for that is because when we tell a story without knowing the whole story, or both sides of the story, or the complete truth, we are bearing false witness. And caffeine, interestingly, lowers the ability or decreases the ability to discern. And as the end of the world draws near, our minds need to be completely in tune with God. And our ability to discern between right and wrong needs to be very sharp. So we, um, well, we've spoken about this legal drugs, but there is another drug that we don't think of when we think of drugs. It's called sugar. More and more, sugar is being considered a drug in the sense of having the same effect as other drugs. And um, why are drugs so popular? Because they cause a certain kind of pleasure or well-being. And uh, being honest with ourselves, have we experienced pleasure and well-being from sugar? Of course we have. Yes. Uh, there's a term called comfort food, correct? Comfort foods usually are either sweet or, have st or starchy. The starch is actually long chains of sugar. That's what starch is. So starchy, sweet, or even um, oily or fatty foods can be comforting. In fact, there is a, I Googled it, uh, the, the number one comfort food, pizza. Number two comfort food, ice cream. And so, but what happens when we have excessive amounts of these? They actually decrease the power, the energy, the strength of the frontal lobe. Too. So God has created sugars for us to enjoy. You probably can guess what I'm going to show next. Though you have no need to feel guilty when you're eating very sweet watermelon or very sweet cherries or very sweet kiwi fruit or mangoes or whatever you like. No reason to feel guilty at all about enjoying those wonderful sweets that actually have the same effect. They also cause well-being and euphoria. The fruits do too. And a recent study showed people who eat at least two servings of fruit a day decrease their diabetes risk by 30%. And so it used to be thought that fruit was damaging for diabetics. It was bad for diabetics because it would raise the blood sugar, but now we know it's not true. Now we know that diabetics can eat fruit as long as it's with the meals. And they will not have any adverse effects from it. it. On the contrary, their diabetes gets better. And so no between meals, no, not, fruit is not for snacking, but just to eat a good amount. And whenever we have a meal, we can uh, eat three, fruit, three fruits a day. That would be great. And also the veggies, of course. And the brain really likes this. The brain will function much better with fruits and veggies than with anything else. Because the brain needs all that glucose that they will bring. And so we've mentioned things that damage the brain, that we need to be careful. And now we're mentioning things that will strengthen. And when we say the brain, we mean the frontal lobe. Again, because we're talking about this area where the mind is. And that's what we want to strengthen. So, we, so our spirituality is strong. Our morality is strong, and our willpower is strong. 
Are those tests important? As we near the end of time, as a, as a final test comes upon the children of God, for well, mighty important. And this is a very important, timely message. Do you know that um, we can, we can um, find illustrations regarding uh, salvation, what God wants to do in our lives, in the sanctuary, correct? We can find that. And um, we know that in the sanctuary there is the outer court, there is the altar of sacrifice, there is a labor, and then you go into the holy place and you see the candlestick, you see the table of showbread, you see the altar of incense right before, of course there is a curtain that is right before the Ark of the Covenant, which is represents the throne of God. And some people creatively have likened our brain to the most holy place in the sense that that is where God wants to write his law. Because in the holy place it was the Ark of the most holy place, it was the Ark of the Covenant, and inside the Ark of the Covenant was a law. And the law, of course, is the covenant. That's why it's called the Ark of the Covenant, because inside it's the Ten Commandments, which are the covenant. And so that's where God wants to write his law. So that's why it's so important that we take care of it, because we want God to finish his work in each one of our lives. Don't we? Amen. Amen. So we need to feed the frontal lobe with good, good energy. Studies have been done regarding children, children who uh, eat a lot of sugar and they have decreased mathematical ability and they have more trouble with discipline. And so we talk, we, we spoke regarding damage of frontal lobe in children. Well, that would be one of the causes that a child is having a hard time with staying um, calm collected, being obedient, and so forth, is excess sugar. Uh, and having a hard time doing well in school is excess sugar. But if they increase their consumption of fruits and veggies, guess what? They do better. So that's what we need to keep in mind. There is a researcher Let's see, let's go back to this slide. Uh, just a quote, a quote from Minister Healy. It says, grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. They impart a strength, and po a, a strength, a power of endurance, and a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. Minister of Healing, page 298. A doctor out in California, his name is Dean Ornish, who has, for the last 20, 30 years, has been doing studies on the benefits of a Eden diet, so to speak, a plant-based diet. He demonstrated in the Lifestyle Heart Trial the vegetarians actually improve their mental well-being and experience more pleasure and less depression. The more plant-based their diet, the greater the benefit. So there is a connection between Eden's diet and well-being, mental health. Let's talk about something else. Shifting gears a little from what we drink or eat to what we see what we watch, observe. Let's talk about hypnosis. So hypnosis attempts to cancel out the frontal lobe functions and brings people into a trance in which they are highly suggestible. This is most easily accomplished by training the eyes to focus in on one object, the best object being a little flickering light. The person will record information and duties without interpretation or without frontal lobe activity. So we said the frontal lobe is what, al what allows us to discern between right and wrong. So what happens if we block it out? Then we record information and duties without interpretation, without discernment. Is this 
Is this according to the word of God or is this not? We need our frontal lobe to help us with that. But if it's blocked out, then that does not happen. And all the information comes into our brain unfiltered. Now you might say, well, I will never do hypnosis. And you would be right. We should never do that. But is going to a hypnotist the only way we can be hypnotized? And the answer is no. There is a form of hypnosis that happens every day, and we may not be aware of it. And that is television, and now, nowadays, television is going out of style, it's going to screen, right? iPad, iPhone, computer. That's what has taken the place of television, but the same concept applies. Theatrical productions, whether you call it movies or cartoons, music videos, all kinds of theatrical productions, video games and social media cause a form of hypnosis. And again, what do we say? Why is hypnosis so dangerous? Because it blocks out the frontal lobe and it impairs our ability to tell between right and wrong. Additionally, it requires no physical activity, so it's not only affecting the mind, but also the body, because sedentary, a sedentary lifestyle is destructive. And a big sad fact is that a lot of our children are being educated by the screens. The average child spends about 26 or more hours a week in front of the screen, this requires little mental activity, slows metabolism, so it increases obesity, it increases daydreaming, and it, de and it decreases creative imagination. At some point, uh, some people wanted to promote video games and other um, videos and so forth as something that would pro promote him imagination or creativity in children, but that has been disproven. That is not the case. In fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, says that children between the ages of zero and two should have no screen time whatsoever. Zero. That's what they recommend. And so even videos like Baby Einstein and those kinds of things, or uh, Baby Mozart, uh, they're not recommended. Between zero and two, zero screen time. Actually, what benefits the child most is looking into the eyes of their parents. Yeah. That is what benefits the child the most, especially the babies when they're being breastfed, when the mother makes eye contact, and just smiles, that just does so much for the brain of a child and their heart, of course, too, their mental health. And, uh, and as, as, as children grow, they will, they will love this. They will love looking into the eyes of their parents and their smile. And uh, it's just such a healthy thing to do. Much, much, much more preferred than a child looking at a screen. Although it may be convenient, it is not convenient. What else regarding the problems that we can that we can have as a result of spending time in front of the screen? It also decreases interest in reading. Have you ever found yourself not wanting to read the Bible or the books of the Spirit of Prophecy? Decreases interest in learning, reduces discernment, trains in non-reaction increases aggressiveness, reduces sensitivity to violence, and it's addictive. So similar to sugar, screen time, theatrical productions, movies, shows, series, etc., they will create an addiction. Uh, there is such a thing as binge watching. It illustrates that this is addictive. Uh, people will want to go from one show to another, and then at the end, after binge watching, have you ever binge watched? 
I'll confess I have in the past. And how does it leave you feeling at the end? Empty. There's emptiness. Or like, I, I can't wait for the next thing to come out. There's no, there is no peace, there is no satisfaction. <clears throat> think, think about this for a moment. Watch, sit down and watch TV or whatever screen or program you're watching, for example, commercial, for 30 minutes with an analytical mind. Analyze everything you're watching. Question everything you're watching. I guarantee you will not be able to watch it more than 30 minutes. Because it, you'll begin to see so many things that are wrong. You'll be like, why am I watching this? Amen. And to do that, you have, your frontal lobe has to be engaged. But most of the time what we do is we want to relax when we're watching something. So what do we do? We just sit back and relax. and. Not, and you know, we don't want to analyze because that takes work. And so what's happening is that there's no discernment. You know, the, the, the information is coming in unfiltered because the frontal lobe is being locked down. They actually looked at the ability of people to detect a lie. Uh, what was easier? Detecting a lie when you were listening to something, detecting a lie when you're reading, or detecting a lie when you're watching. And they found out that 73% of those who participated were able to detect a lie when they were listening. So someone was reading and they read something that was clearly not true. They said, oh, that's not true. If they were reading a newspaper, they were able to detect it 64% of the time. But if they were watching, only 52% of the time. They looked at young people. They took MTV away for five months. And guess what happened? Verbal aggression decreased 32%. Aggression against objects decreased 52%. And aggression against other people decreased 48% just from removing um, MTV for five months. MTV actually gives you a double whammy. Not only are you watching a theatrical production which already blocks out the frontal lobe because it causes this effect of hypnosis. Remember, hypnosis is best achieved when a flick, with, a, with a flickering light. So if you're watching something intently and the light is flickering, and your mind is blocked out, your frontal lobe is blocked out. And so, why did I say that MTV gives a double whammy? Because you're watching that, which is already kind of hypnotizing your brain, but also there's something to be said about music itself. Music itself also has an impact on the frontal lobe, independent of the impact or the harm that TV has. How so? Well, music was created by God for our enjoyment. But it was created with a purpose. And the purpose was to worship Him. That is the purpose of music. To glorify God. To sing His praises. And music, God meant it to be inspiring. It stirs us. It's stirring. Because music, when it enters the brain through the ears, the ears catch it, then it goes into some areas of the brain, it en enters the areas of the brain through the emotional regions, which include the temporal lobe and the limbic system. And we'll, later this weekend, we'll touch on the limbic system a little bit to tell you what that is. It's the seat of emotions. And we'll see what the place of that is and what God's will regarding that uh, area of the brain is. So music goes there first. But then there are some types of music that go from the, air, the emotional areas of the brain to the frontal lobe, and they, pro they produce a frontal lobe response that influences the will, the moral worth, 
and the reasoning power. See, a, a church service is, is important for the church service to include music. Especially the type of music that is going to prepare the listeners to hear the word of God. Amen. That is the type of music that needs to be played. And so we must be careful with the type of music that we listen to at home and at church. Because we always want to be in tune with God, don't we? Amen. I mean, if you had a friend who knew the future, would you want to console that friend all the time? Brothers and sisters, isn't that what God does? Doesn't he know the future? Amen. In Isaiah 46, he says, I am, I am the true God. No one can tell the future. No other gods can. Only I can. I know the end from the beginning. And so we also always want to be consulting God and in contact with God. And so our choices of different things that we do, like we've seen, including what we listen to, is important to keep our minds in tune with God. And so, for example, there's some music that will cause an emotional response, but no frontal lobe response. And so if it, only, if it only stimulates the emotions, but it doesn't go to the frontal lobe, it doesn't really prepare us to hear the Word of God. And these types of music are those who have predominantly beats, or syncopation is the term for those who know music. Syncopation means that the beat falls in its offbeat, so to speak. It falls on the, on the, on the uh, second beat, the emphasis falls on the second beat as opposed to the first one. There is even a physiologic reason why this music is not good. It's because it's offbeat with our own physiologic rhythm that we have. The heart beats in a certain rhythm. Well, this music is off. So it creates a dissonance. And so it doesn't um, help the frontal lobe be strong to hear the word of God. And so uh, examples of this music would be rock and roll, would be jazz, would be blues, even country music, uh, because they have that, they have those, those beats. And so a lot of um, modern music, and we, you know, we can mention to rap and the other uh, types of music that are common, uh, hip hop and so forth. Uh, now those music genres are being mixed and other music is being produced. But what has happened is that this style of music has also uh, invaded, so to speak, or been mixed with what is called now Christian music, or contemporary Christian music. And so we must be careful uh, to recognize that. Now, preach, preach, doctor. <laughs> yes. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Alvin Topher says, constant stimulation of the senses shuts down the analytical process and ultimately shuts down the ability to face life rationally. This leads to escape techniques that involve withdrawal, apathy, and rejection of disciplined thinking when faced with difficult duties and decisions. Uh, in, this, in the University of Oklahoma, they've actually done studies on the effect of certain types of music on the brain, and they've actually seen that music is, in a way, or has similar um, effects as drugs do on the brain. It causes a sense of euphoria, but when the music finishes, it, begin, it, it almost causes a sense of withdrawal. Uh, so it could sometimes it could be said that people who get used to listening to a certain type of music, uh, when they're not listening, they need to get a fix from it. So they, they have to go back and listen to it again in order to arouse emotions or feelings of well-being. Now, again, music has its place, but it must not take the place of the Word of God. 
the word of God and his promises is what God has given us so that we can live by every word that lives out of the mouth of God. Because our religion should not be based on emotion, should it? Amen. It should be based upon the word of God. Amen. And thus says the Lord, emotions come and go, but the word of God remains forever. Amen. And therefore, when our emotions are down, when we're discouraged, when we are worried and anxious, the, we must go to the Word of God to find peace and believe the promises as if they were a reality. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is what? It's the substance of the things what? Not seen. The reality of things, and did I say it right? Is the certainty of the things not seen and the substance of things hoped for. Well, I'm misquoting, please forgive me. But I think the concept is clear that faith is believing that something that you do not see is actually real and you can count me. That is faith and that is what God is inviting us to do. And so by feeding the frontal lobe, by strengthening the frontal lobe, then our faith can get stronger because we can communicate with God more easily. So what music then should we prefer? If we should avoid those music that only stimulates emotion, that has, that has a lot of beats in it, in it, that makes our hips swing from one side to the other. We should avoid that because it doesn't help the frontal lobe. So what should we prefer? So here are some uh, principles that you can use to choose the right music. The music must have a melody that you can follow. You, miss, you, you, you should be able to tell what the main line, the main melody is, and be able to sing along to the tune. Now, some of the music that we have said don't help fulfill this principle. So they, they actually have a melody you can follow, and they're catchy, and so forth. But this is not the only thing we should keep in mind when we're choosing the right music. It must also tell a story. Well, and again, we go back, some of these genres will tell a story, too, but what kind of story are they telling? That's the other thing. You know, we need to pay attention to the story that they're telling. Number three, the harmony must be under the melody. So the harmony must not be the, the main feature of the music. The melody must be the one. And uh, if you think of the hymns from the hymnal, they actually fulfill these principles. The melody is the main thing that you hear, and the harmony only supports the melody, and not the other way around. Syncopation can be present, but in periods no larger than 30 seconds. The syncopation is mainly produced by drums, but it can also be produced by piano and by guitar and other instruments. And the syncopation is, is that beat, that off beat that I was telling you. Uh, and you can use it to beautify music, but it must not last the whole song. 30 seconds of syncopation is what the brain will put up with, and after that, it kind of disengages. Uh, then drums used, but as march and march rhythms, and not in offbeat. Um, so those are some of the uh, principles. Another principle is that um, it must speak eternal truth. The words of a song need to be based upon the Word of God. So it must be in accordance to the Word of God. That is the music God wants us to, wants us to listen to. Now I mentioned the hymns, but there is also uh, sacred music written in the period of Baroque or in, in classic. So compositions by Bach, compositions by Handel, by Vivaldi, and some of the compositions of Mozart and Haydn and all those composers. A lot of our hymns are based on, on, on their compositions, on their music. And they're beautiful. There's beautiful music that was produced by them that uh, was written for sacred purposes. For example, Bach, every piece of music he wrote, he uh, initialed it with some initials that stand for to the glory of God. 
it was in German, so I don't really know the initials, but it was to the glory of God. He wrote every piece as a piece of worship to God, so Bach. We have Handel, for example, who wrote Handel's Messiah. And Handel's Messiah is a beautiful piece uh, because every song, they're known as arias, every aria is a Bible verse. They're quoting a Bible verse, every song. And if you listen to it, you can hear all the messianic prophecies. For, you can hear the ones that predicted his first coming. You can hear the ones that predicted his ministry in the sanctuary and in the most holy place. And you can hear the ones that predict his second coming. And you can hear the ones that predict his glorious kingdom. They're all in that piece, Handel's Messiah. Beautiful piece. And uh, that the, 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 the verses will ring in your head. There is probably no better way to memorize scripture than in song, in song. And you know that the songs that we read nowadays, they were songs. People used to sing the songs and they would memorize them. And you know what? One of the books that Jesus quoted the most, guess which one? The Psalms. Do you think he do you think he, he, he sung the Psalms when he was a boy? Of course he did. That's why he knew them so well. And he obviously another book he quoted a lot from was Deuteronomy, but he also quoted from many, many other books. And the Old Testament, he knew his Bible and he lived by every word. Studies have been done about music therapy. Uh, do you know any examples in the Bible of music therapy? King Saul, that's right, he had a mental illness and David would come and place his, his heart and he would calm his spirit. Well, they actually did this. Uh, they played music to uh, some patients and after 12 weeks of music to uh, 23 to 45 year olds, they saw improved scores on test and overall mood, on test of overall mood, reported uh, feeling less depressed, feeling less fatigue, and they measured their cortisol levels and they noticed that they were down. Cortisol is a stress hormone, it's, it's a fight or flight hormone. It's high whenever there is a lot of stress, either real or perceived. And it is actually a, a hormone that will go to the brain and will blunt short-term memory. Cortisol levels, chronic cortisol levels, cause a decrease in short-term memory. And uh, that's one of the negative effects of it. It also raises the blood pressure, raises the blood sugar, uh, raises the heart rate, it does a number of things in, in the body, it increases inflammation. So having high cortisol levels is not a good thing. Music therapy can help lower them. Other things that we're going to mention later this weekend is that, for example, breathing exercises lower cortisol levels and help with restore um, well-being in our frontal lobes. So we must take care of our frontal lobes by protecting them from mechanical injury, so violent with good oxygen, giving them good nutrition, getting adequate sunshine and exercise, controlling the inputs. There is a name given to the senses in the spirit of prophecy. Does anyone know? The avenues of the soul. Of the, soul. the avenues of the soul. Those are the inputs. Everything that comes to our senses is what actually uh, will nourish or harm our frontal lobe. Prevent or control disease that affects the frontal lobe. Uh, certain medications can damage the frontal lobe or I would say harm, but it's reversible. We stop the medication, the, the, damage, the harm uh, is reversed. Uh, medications such as narcotics, benzodiazepines, and even some medicines that are used for allergies, for example. If we take too much Benadryl, it will actually decrease our short-term memory. And uh, so we should need to be careful uh, and aim to, to look for the root of the problem. Well, whenever we're suffering an illness, we need to hit at the root of the problem and see what can be done 
to change behavior, to change life. There are different books that we can read. Uh, there is a compilation called Healthful Living. Uh, and it's a compilation of writings by E.G. White that is uh, quite useful and can give us good a good foundation to ourselves be able to um, understand our bodies, get at the root of the problem, and adopt good habits. I left the best for last. What is probably the best thing we can do for our friends of all? And I, I take back my sense, not probably, what is the best thing we can do for our front of all? And that is the Word of God. Providing input, the right input to our front of all. So even if we, after this presentation, we realize we've been doing a lot of wrong things in regards to our front of all, and we want to be sure that we strengthen it so that we lower our risk of depression and anxiety, yeah. of other personality disorders. We need to feed it every day with the Word of God. The Bible, just as it reads, is to be our guide. Nothing is so calculated to enlarge the mind and strengthen the intellect as the study of the Bible. No other study will so elevate the soul and give vigor to the faculties as the study of the living world. Amen. One more. It says, the Bible is more effective than any other book, or all other books combined. Isn't that an amazing statement? More effective than any other book, or all other books combined. The greatness of its themes, the dignified simplicity of its utterances, the beauty of its imagery, quicken and uplift the thoughts as nothing else can. No other study can impart such mental power as does the effort to grasp the stupendous truths of Revelation. The mind thus brought in contact with the thoughts of the infinite cannot, cannot but expand and strengthen. The education one to four. Praise the Lord for that. And I'll, I'll tell you, if you're not used to reading the Bible or if it seems too hard to understand, God is good to us. He is merciful to us. And in these last days, he's given us a special message, a message of love sent through his servant, E.G. White. And she's written books about the Bible, the Conflict of the Ages series, Patriots and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, Great Controversy. You can read these along with the Bible, and they will make the Bible come alive. You will come to understand those eternal truths and prepare you for the heavenly kingdom. Let me ask you, how many of you here long to be in the heavenly kingdom? Long to be with Jesus? I long to be with Jesus, and God is asking us now, this is the time to prepare. There is a preparation that needs to be made so we can be fit for the heavenly kingdom. And he's given us all the tools that we need, all the knowledge that we need, his word. And so let's go to his word. Let's feed it and expand our minds. And let's ask if we, if in any area of our lives we need self-control, we can ask him and he will give it to us. Because it's a gift of the Spirit. And it's a gift. That means you don't have to do anything to earn it. You just have to ask for it, and He will give it to you. May God bless you tonight. It is my prayer, and we will see you tomorrow.